Hello everyone. I recently got to learn a little bit about humpback whale songs. I'd like to share a TikTok video I made about that paper. Then I'd like to go a little bit deeper into the paper and then talk about fish choruses. I'm Cameron and this is my channel. Welcome to the sexy universe. A couple weeks ago, I got the chance to learn a little bit about these guys, and I'd like to share with you, and I hope you'll stay to the end of the video because I need your help. I got the chance to communicate a little bit with Dr. Elisa Girola. Uh, she is a research data officer at the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network in Australia, and this is her team on their research vessel. Dr. Girola's specific area of research is marine acoustics, in particular, whale songs. In her most recent paper, she looked at how whales respond to the noise coming from boats, as compared to the sounds that exist in the natural environment, in particular, wind. Specifically, their research looked at whale pods uh, that are between the Great Barrier Reef and the Queensland coast. They used a test vessel to produce noise uh, that's represented by the red line in this image. The yellow dots represent where their microphones were set up, and the blue lines represent whale th where the whales were. They examined over 1,400 recordings. Some of them had wind sounds. Some of them also had vessel noise. It turned out the singing whales would adjust their volume for wind noise, but not for vessel noise. The researchers had to be choosy about when they took their recordings uh, because there are periodic disturbances, and one of them they mentioned is fish choruses, which I had never heard of. So let me play this one for you. And just like humpback whales sing as part of their mating and feeding behavior, it turns out fish, or at least a lot of different species of fish, do the same thing. I asked Dr. Girola if in her experience, uh, ocean animals depend more on sound than land animals do. And she said, in general, this is true because light doesn't travel as far in the ocean, so you can't see as far so they rely more on things like sound or chemical signals. I also learned from her that fish choruses are so loud that they can mask out everything else. Obviously, there's a lot more to learn from Dr. Girola, and the good news is she's willing to be interviewed. But this is where I need your help, because if we're gonna live stream that interview, I need a thousand followers. I also wanna be able to ask your questions, not just mine. So if you haven't followed me yet, please hit the follow button and leave your questions for Dr. Girola in the comments. So a few of the viewers on TikTok did leave useful questions that I will pose to Dr. Girola. And if you're enjoying this content so far, please hit the like button. And if you've got questions or any thoughts you'd like to share, please put them in the comments section. It helps the YouTube algorithm. Now I'd like to go a little bit further into the paper and discuss some of the things I learned. So just a little bit about humpback whales. Uh, they are the best known whales in the ocean. They're famous for their songs. The lifespan of a humpback whale is about 45 or 50 years. Last century, they were heavily hunted, particularly by the Soviet Union, actually. Uh, and they were hunted to the point, not, not where they were close to extinction, but where they were a threatened species. And right here we have a map of what their range is now. Their primary range, which is the dark blue, as you can see, is mostly around the continents. Their secondary range is almost the entire ocean. There are a couple of dead zones along the equator in the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean uh, where it's possible they might go through, but it doesn't look like they do. Uh, the reason is because the oxygen levels and everything at this point in the ocean just aren't as good mainly because the ocean is hotter here. Uh, since the oxygen levels aren't as high, there isn't as much food for the whales. And that's because they mainly eat krill, uh, which are very small animals that live in the ocean and get their oxygen from the water. 
humpback whales, uh, they breathe air like you and I do because they're mammals. So the level of oxygen in the ocean doesn't have that big of an impact on their ability to live in the short term. And one of my favorite films is, of course, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Uh, in Star Trek IV, uh, an alien ship shows up in the future attempting to communicate with Earth. And nobody can figure out what they're saying. Uh, and this ship flies over the Earth and it starts pulling all the water up out of the ocean. And, and that's obviously going to destroy all of humanity. Well, someone figures out that what these aliens are transmitting is actually humpback whale songs. And so the Enterprise, Kirk, Spock, Scotty, McCoy, they all got to go back in time uh, to when the humpback whales were still around and bring a couple of them into the future so that they can communicate with these alien beings. And obviously that's all science fiction. But it emphasizes the point that when we cause damage to our natural world, when we do damage to the ecosystems around us, and when species go extinct, they have impacts into the future, and we don't know what those impacts are going to be. And eventually they will affect us or future generations of humanity. So if there is any way to conserve and preserve the species that live around us, we need to do it. Dr. Girola directed me to this website, dosits.org. Uh, I will put a link to this page in the description. There are actually several humpback whale songs on here that are actually in the public domain that you can go listen to, and I'll play a couple of them right now. <laughs> This next sound I'm going to play is a feeding sound. And it's actually hypothesized that that sound startles fish and stirs them up, which then makes it easier for the humpback whales to consume them. All right, so this is the page for the paper, and of course I'll link this on the website. It's entitled, Singing Humpback Whales Respond to Wind Noise, But Not to Vessel. And the researchers outline how they found this out and why it may not be as important as it initially seems. One phrase they use frequently throughout the paper is Lombard effect. The Lombard effect just means that when background noise increases, the animal doing the communicating increases its volume to make up for it. And one problem that's showing up in ecosystems all over the world, both on land and at sea, human industries, vehicles, and machines make a lot of noise, and animals that live in those areas have to adapt. And it becomes problematic when animals can't adapt, because it affects their ability to find food, mates, and to raise offspring. One thing Dr. Girola pointed out is that, in general, Ocean animals rely more on sound than land animals do, and it's because light doesn't travel as far in water. And one thing that's been known for a while is that humpback whales increase the volume of their sounds in response to wind noise. The location for this study was chosen because humpback whales have a breeding ground in the Great Barrier Reef, and then they move up and down along the coast of Australia both to look for food and to socialize with other humpback whales. And as shipping levels increase around Australia, it's more and more possible that the lives of these humpback whales could be disrupted by it. This is the image I showed in my TikTok video, uh, and it shows basically where they set up their microphones, where the, the whales were located, and where their ship tracked to create noise. What this image shows is a breakdown of the vessel noise. And you'll notice on the x-axis at the bottom here is the different frequencies. And on the y-axis is how loud they were. So you can see at different frequencies how loud the noise was. And this is important because it shows both the frequency and amplitude of all these different components of ship noise. So when you think about noise in this case, we have to think about it as a set of components, a set of different sounds. The authors point out that humpback whale songs evolved in an environment where there was no human noise. 
but now they're being exposed to human generated noise and they're not able to see that these humpback whales are adjusting their volume upward to compensate for that noise. The authors note that there may be other strategies that these whales are using. Uh, they would be neurological strategies. The first is spatial release from masking. Human beings, we have two eyes that are in the front like most predators do. And with those two eyes being in the front, uh, when their angles change and our brain can detect those slightly different angles, that sensory perception from our brain allows us to interpret distance. And that's an advantage of binocular frontal vision. Well, we've also got two ears that are on separate sides of our head. So if a sound comes from your right, it hits your right ear first, and then it goes around and hits your left ear. And because it has to go around the shape of your head, the, the waves that hit your right ear are going to be slightly different from the sound waves that hit your left ear. Your brain can translate those differences and tell which direction the sound is coming from. And it's entirely possible that humpback whales are doing the same thing to differentiate vessel noise from the songs of other humpback whales. And this would make sense. If a humpback whale is singing under the water, the sound of a vessel above the water is going to seem like it's coming from a different direction. A second strategy they mention is comodulation masking release. And this is a difficult thing to understand. In fact, I don't think I completely understand it. In fact, I know I don't. But from what I do understand, it's basically a way to tell the difference between the components of a sound. For example, looking again at the graph of the vessel noise, we can see these different components of the sound. And if some of these are co-modulated, then the humpback whales should be able to tell them apart. This page on co-modulated masking release has an example that helped me to understand the concept better. I'll leave a link to this page in the description. So the instructions say, first play it with the modulation off and then turn it on. So let's get this going. And as you can hear, there's a difference between when, in, when a sound has co-modulation and when it doesn't. Co-modulation masking release is a strategy used by many animals, including songbirds. One of the background noises that was mentioned in the paper was fish choruses. And this is something I hadn't heard of before, so I went ahead and looked into it. And one thing Dr. Girola mentioned to me is that fish choruses are very loud and they mask everything else. Fish choruses are basically groups of fish, usually different species, singing all at once. The sounds they're making have the same purpose as birdsong, uh, to attract mates and to call other members of the species to areas where food is available. So they're actually pretty common in coral reefs, though they weren't recorded very much until recently. Here's a fish chorus from SoundCloud, which I will also link in the description. The two species that are involved in this chorus are Jewfish and Batfish. This YouTube video, which I'll also link to, shows several different fish songs. Uh, I'll just play a few seconds. It's an entire world of song that exists under the ocean which I wouldn't have known anything about if I hadn't seen this paper. This paper discussed how birds in urban environments have to adjust the frequencies and the volume of their songs to make up for urban noise, while birds living outside of cities don't have to do that. And just as birds are changing their songs and singing louder, so are fish. So the fact that we're not seeing that same phenomenon uh, in humpback whale song is somewhat surprising. With a little luck, I'll be able to interview Dr. Girola soon. So if you've got any questions about bioacoustics, humpback whales, uh, Queensland, Australia, that coastline, the Great Barrier Reef, please leave those thoughts and questions in the comments section and I'll get those questions over to her.
That's it for this video. If you enjoyed hearing about all this, please hit the like and subscribe button. You can also watch my other videos. You can also follow me on Instagram and TikTok. My handle is at Cam Wadam, C-A-M-W-A-D-A-M. I'll put those links in the bio, and I'll see you next time on The Sexy Universe.